Dr. F- well, first off, hey, Jerry, thanks for putting this together. I know it's a lot of work to do these conferences. I really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, it's always, uh, you know, it's a challenge for everybody to travel or just to put the time and effort and resources in to be here. So I'm really honored just to be able to have a chance of speaking to you today. Uh, several things. First off, uh, it's a lot of fun to do this stuff. It also, I was going to show a video, so I'm going to skip this. I was going to show you a video of what happens sometimes when you can hurt your neck and do things. But that's, that's, that's probably beyond the scope of this. So first, security related symptoms or syndromes. This is really a tough thing. First off, the reason is because I really hate the term Chiari. And I'll tell you the reason why. I think it's an old term. Thank you, Hal. <laughs> so I think it's an old term. It really was, uh, first I hate terms that are really named after doctors or scientists because those things are just in homage to someone who's thought to be great, and, uh, but they really don't tell you what's going on. It just makes, when I was in medical school, I had to memorize all these names and terms, and I had to go back and decipher into maybe what it was, and I had to go back and decipher and figure out what caused it, then I had to go back and do more, and then I had to still go back and call it a Chiari malformation. It made no sense to me. So I'd much rather get to the point of describing things by really what they are. And it's really as important when you think of, now we're trying to take something we can't even understand how to describe it and say what it's related to, and we call that another name. So it gets really confusing. That's why I hate terms. So I'll start with the first term called Chiari. So then, so where's it go from there, right? So what is a Chiari malformation? How do we define it? All right, fine. Then we can't even answer, we, it's hard to do that. You hear many, many talks today putting together pictures of what are anatomical or morphological or, or pictures that show you something. And then we struggle to say what that picture means. We struggle to say what caused that picture in the first place. We group it together by trying to link together different aspects, whether it was something you're born with, all right? whether it's something um, uh, maybe you acquired through some other way, or so, what affected it, what's really dry, and, and going into more details about it, but it was hard for us to define it. The second thing, then we try to again layer, again layer on top of that what are those conditions associated with it, which go through the same struggle and process of trying to find what caused it, what, what, where did it come from, were you something you're born with or not born with, or what, ha what have you, um, then what happens, trying to link those two together gets to be really tough. So we have to therefore move forward and say, OK, when you have symptoms, is the Chiari the problem? Or is this related condition a problem, right? It would be nice if they both at least have the same underlying driving mechanism that led to them. Then at least maybe targeting that makes some sense. And we can maybe put them together. Or maybe, unfortunately, just bad luck. We have this thing called Occam's razor. We believe most diseases you have, most groups of symptoms should be linked to one root cause. The problem is that what if there's multiple root causes to or multiple root symptoms? So you have a Chiari, you just heard, and you have migraines. It's tough. Maybe they're, maybe they're true, true and unrelated. Maybe you may have symptoms, a little bit of both. How do, you, how do you sort those out? How do you sort out the fact they really are driven by two fundamentally different mechanisms of causation, development, however you want to look at it? Hmm? In 15 minutes. Yeah, there you go. Well, hopefully, yeah, OK, I got you. I love audience participation. So why is this critical? Because again, if we're really going to get to the point of how we treat and prevent the problem, we got to figure out what is, um, you know, we got to understand this so we can really drive to the point of treating what is the root underlying condition to help cause, to help get some degree of control on those symptoms. And that's really the trick, right? So again, the QRI malformation, I heard about this earlier. Uh, <clears throat> I think your very first talk, Tina gave the talk, but I want to do a little spin on that a little bit. All right. There are all these different types, OK? You've seen them before. There's nothing novel about these pictures. The way I sort of look at them, they're really a group together, right? First, the type 1 group or complex is sort of one grouping. We think that's maybe due to some overlying problem of bone development. Then there's these other two groups, which may be something, the type 2 and the type 4 may be related to something fundamental in brain development or some issue affecting the brain more. So, the, so type 4, you don't have development. The, the brainstem is skinny and narrow, and the, and the cerebellum is, is not developed properly. That's, 
something fundamentally about the nervous system that's wrong with it, right? A type three, there's a lot of brain there, but the brain's protruded. So there's something also wrong with maybe the bones and the tissues and the membranes around it. So there's a different driving point to get there, right? The brain itself, though, structurally looks, looks often normal, except for the part that tends to protrude out. That gets secondarily disrupted, at least that's what we believe. So this is almost like an encephalocele. So it's different. So we sort of like think about them in different groups to help sort it out so then we can say, well, hey, maybe this first cluster is developmental, right? Leading to something abnormal in the posterior fossa. But unfortunately, we could see that degree of zero, you know, minimal tonsil herniation, maximal tonsil and brain stem herniation, or somewhere in between, called type one, associated with secondary conditions. If you put a lumbar perineal shunt in, you'll see it chronic LP, something like this. Sometimes even with other conditions called idiopathic intracranial hypertension, you can have some crowding. So is it really something that's, so what's the root cause? Again, uh, so developmentally, uh, we call hypoplastic posterior fossa, some abnormality, the whole structure of the back part of the skull. It's probably developmental too. Maybe related to cranial synostosis, but could be due to something else, right? The other cluster, we still think is, we see underlying conditions of the nervous system, like spina bifida. But we also see abnormal hindbrain development, such as in the type four. But you can see type fours with myelomeningocele. So it's, it's unclear, all right? And then it comes to, again, the type three. Is that a, what is that? Mesodermal defect, meaning that some problem is, which think leads to causes like encephalocele. So, we're really going to focus on the end of the day is forgetting all those and focus on type 1 and the variants of type 1. Because that's really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about, particularly when we're talking about other associated symptoms. And I could spend all day discussing type 4s and all the variant of brain developmental anomalies that goes along with those. But really, clinically speaking, most of us here really will focus on type 1. So we'll, we'll spend our time doing that. Again, let's go back, ask ourselves the questions. Is this a brain problem? Is this a, bone, it's a skull or a bone problem? Is it both? Maybe it's neither. Maybe something else drove it. Is it something you're born with? Is it something that you acquire? Right? Does the presence of one of these associated things, like a syrinx or hydrocephalus, what does that mean to this? Maybe it's, maybe it's something you're born with. Maybe it's secondary. Maybe it's the primary cause of the problem. I think it's important to think that way. Uh, let's skip this. So I think it's important to think that way because we go back to this old definition of defining it by this degree of cerebral tonsil herniation, which is one small descriptor that now, as I sort of showed you, really may not be relevant. We may have to really fundamentally think about it totally differently. Okay. Then we get to, okay, all right, we agree. There's something there. It's herniated down. It's pushed down. You know, I think Roger and... Kula, Dr. Kula talks about this, and there's all these mechanisms. Typically, we talk about three. Maybe the brain is pushed down because maybe the brain, maybe the tonsils and cerebellum, and, I mean, cerebellum tonsils and brain stem are, her, are protruded or herniated down. Why? Mainly, may, maybe because it's pushed down from something above, a cyst, maybe hydrocephalus, maybe a tumor, something like this. Well, often radiologists will see a kid with a, or I take care of kids, so I'll, I'll often use kids. No offense to adults. Hope you don't mind that. But we'll see a kid that has a tumor, and they'll say, oh, the tumor's there, and there's this Chiari. I'm like, that's, that's a big tumor. OK, the cerebellum tonsils pushed down. I don't want to call that a Chiari. It's just secondary tonsil herniation, because it's a tumor in the cerebellum. I don't call that a Chiari, but the radiologist will, call, will often call it that. You will get a note on, your, you know, on some imaging study that calls it that. But is that real Chiari? No, that's a tumor. Sure, everything is pushed out when you have a tumor. I'd rather just them say, well, the cerebellum tonsils are protruded down to the frame of magnum, and the cistern of magnum is obliterated because there's a tumor there. So things can push it down. Maybe it can pull down. Maybe there's a thing called tethered cord, something or can tug it down, or some other mechanism that pulls it down from below. Right? So maybe also, I'll throw some other things. Maybe instead of pulling, maybe it's leak. Maybe, this, as we know, we compartmentalize, and if you have CSF leaking from below, you build up gradients of pressure. I don't call that pulling, it's leaking. You, we put a shunt in, you have LPs, you have something, spinal taps, you have something else, so maybe it's leaked down. 
due to changes in pressure between this compartment, as you sort of heard about, and this, between the brain compartment and the spinal compartment. Maybe it's, I made up this, swo I made up all these, but <laughs> swollen down. Maybe there's some diffuse cause of brain swelling. We see this in chronic venous congestion, and like, that, that can happen, and we often associate it with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, a pseudotumor. So the brain probably is engorged from a lack of proper venous drainage. So maybe it's swollen and pushed down. So it's swollen down. Again, that helps us start thinking about how to think about how to treat this, right? Maybe it's squeezed down. So now maybe there is a confinement of the bones in the posterior fossa, at the frame magnum, that squeezes it. Maybe it's slumped down. Right? Maybe something is, is lax and allows the bones to, you know, we'll, we'll get into this with some other disorders, I'm sure. Everyone mentions Dr. Manis, I'm sure will talk about this, but, you know, maybe something happens and looks slumped. And it's just sort of because of the bony confines and the structure, how the bones are angled, it just sort of slumps down. Maybe also, it's just born down and out. <laughs> maybe it's just developed that way. We have no idea why. Maybe it's a variant of normal. Maybe it's just born that way, and that's just what it is. With all that in mind, we have to then say, um, you know, what are all the different, you know, uh, symptoms that this thing can cause? And the reason why I put up symptoms here, not because if you've heard this, and I don't want to go through this in entirety, I think there's some symptoms that are important or not, but the reason why I put up symptoms is a whole lot of them. Some I think we can maybe hang our hat more on. You sort of heard the last talk, talk about maybe headaches and motor weakness, what specific kind of headaches, and then some motor weakness. But there may be other things you may want to classically hang your hat on. I have a couple of hang my hat things myself, but I'm not going to give you my own biases. I just want to say there are things, and you get different opinions from everybody who speaks. So I'm just going to say I think there are things people we feel we can hang our hat on. There's things we feel we can't. It was actually a very important paper uh, written by Tom Miller at, back in, I think, 1999. And he really described out of 360, 365 patients, a, uh, a group of symptoms. And there was a ton, if you read that paper, you'll see so many lists. I was going to actually put up all the lists. You'll see hundreds of symptoms, all grouped together, all with how many patients had what. Interesting to me is that out of all the other sort of hang my hat symptoms that most people will describe, there were symptoms on there that to me were very interesting, such as this didn't work. Is this a laser pointer too? Anyone know is this a laser pointer? No? Okay. All right. So Let's see. Oops. Let me just go back. Sorry. If you don't mind, I'll walk around. I don't have a point. It's how to use my arms. So, such as the classic, well, there's common pain, but there's papilledema. Papilledema is thought to be a common thing we see with increased intracranial pressure. Right? Such as we see with hydrocephalus or with pseudotumor. So why papilledema is a, a symptom group in this, in this group of patients with, with Chiari? Is that Chiari or is that something else? Why do we have things like decreased hearing? Maybe that's brain stem dysfunction. Maybe it's not. Why do we have symptoms such as um, urinary incontinence? You see over to the left. Often thought, when you hear about urinary incontinence, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But it all depends how you describe it. Classic syrinxes have, you heard, sensory dissociation, but you also have a suspended sensory level, meaning that usually you get sparing of the lower function of the spinal cord called the sacral spinal cord that controls bladder. So why incontinence? All right, maybe they're peeing because they have so much pain and something else happens. But you have to ask yourself the questions that it doesn't make anatomical sense. Maybe they have something else going on that led to group of symptoms like incontinence. Uh, and, and that really gets us to the point of then, maybe there are some related things that we're ascribing to Chiari that are related to the structure that may be driving some of the symptoms, such as 
Um, so we'll go through this list in the, over the next uh, few minutes. So first, I'd like to start with the Chiari variants, as we sort of alluded to. I don't know how to characterize them. Is it really the Chiari, or is, are these are these different diseases, are they different structures, different entities? I have no idea. Maybe, they, maybe there's different mechanisms even within these, this group that we're not considering, that I don't know. So maybe we're not really looking at a classic Chiari when we look at these. I want to raise that question because I'm not sure. My gut is that they probably are related. I sort of alluded to that in my earlier slides. That's my, that was my impression. I think. From what I understand about the embryology and the mechanisms of development, I think they are related, either primarily from a developmental problem or secondarily, such as having you know, a lumbar perineal shunt or, you know, or something else that may pull, pull the brain down. I think, I think they're related. But I just want to raise the question, are they really related? Part of the reason is because there's mixed views. Sometimes we believe the degree of herniation has no bearing on symptoms, and even on outcomes. But there's conflicting reports. This says also the degree, of, the, the degree of anatomical variation does have a bearing on outcome. So we don't know how to put that together, right? I, you know, so I, I say that, so maybe because there's a different outcome, because they maybe have some fundamental different diseases, so maybe they are just a related syndrome to what we call Chiari, with a different root cause. I'm hoping I'm going to confuse you throughout this whole talk. So I'm not going to answer any of your questions. Disease like Ellis Danlos, right? Ellis Danlos is another important. Most of the time, we see this more commonly in adults, but it can happen in kids. Ellis Danlos really is a problem of collagen vascular, of how to use collagen and how we process it, how we make it. It's a very important molecule that supports many of our structures in our ligaments, our bones, our skin, our muscles. We, our cell, a lot of our cells have collagen components. Our, all of most of our supportive connective tissues have collagen in them. So there's collagen, and there's many different types of collagen. And unfortunately, in disease like Elvis Danlos, almost all the collagen variants can be affected. So because of that, however, because it's so important in these connective tissues, some are what we call dense connective tissues, like ligaments and tendons, some are in the loose connective tissues. Connective tissues help support our skin. Right? They all can be affected. So because of that, we might see some variations on how bones, that sort of maybe that slumping issue that may lead to things we look at. Then we see this, this change called uh, this tonsillar herniation on the scan. And all of a sudden now, we don't know what, what is doing what. Are they related? Are they cause, are one causing the other? Are they interrelated? We have no idea. Really. There's all these different classes of Elvis Danlos. Um, uh, hopefully, it's too small for you guys to read. There's a lot of different ones. But I think if you think of them like there's sort of the stretchy skin, and then there's the, there's the other ones that tend, because it's a different form of collagen, we think this is inherited in genetic, right? And then there's the ones that affect more the dense collagen or the, or the dense connective tissue collagen matrix where that may be more important in ligaments and tendons. Collagen is also important in blood vessels. There's a rare form that, that blood vessels can actually end up rupturing, such as the aorta. That's a rare form that people can die from. That's a lethal form, often. So, but there's all sort of variants. Fortunately, that's very rare. So how do you think about it in relation to this Chiari? Well, you know, I had a kid, so I'll give you one example. So there was a kid, this kid was about 13, I think, at the time. Um, was taken care of by one of my colleagues, or actually by a guy in town, uh, underwent, looked like, had some symptoms, thought it was, looked at the scan, had a flow study. I don't even know if I trust flow studies totally, but that's an editorial comment. So I'll go back and say, had a flow study, it was abnormal, got a decompression, okay. Um, looks, looks like, I think I saw a picture earlier that had a pretty decent space in this posterior fossa, right? But if you notice, the head is tilted, it's cocked down, because the kid started developing uh, uh, swine deformity and some scoliosis and started having a worsening cough and gag and started getting progressively worse, post-op. So we imaged him and he had, this is a 
3D reconstruction, but essentially it shows that the head is tilting off and slipping forward. He had a workup done at that point, was found to have a form of Ehlers-Danlos. And uh, ultimately, he underwent a spinal fusion, occipital cervical fusion. And you can see the, 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 the fusion construct is on the left, and you can see that now the brainstem is not straighter, and the kid actually had a good improvement. Also developed a little syrinx with this, and the syrinx even got and was improved. Now you can have sometimes, you know, having a, you can have a cervical spinal instability just without Elvis Danlos too. So even though, even though we found there was Elvis Danlos based on genetic testing, I still wasn't sure whether that was the cause, but of course we jumped up and down and said maybe it is. Because honestly, the kid was a little bit young to me. Most of the kids I find with Elvis Danlos, tend to, most of the patients tend to be a little older with more global manifestations of it. Even though they can, and he, you know, when we looked at him, even though clinically, maybe he was a little bit loose in his fingers, but I've seen a lot of people, man, maybe I'm stiff, but I've seen a lot of people be able to move in certain ways that didn't appear to be quite as dramatic as the classic forms of the, um, you know, the, the variants of Ellis Damos with a lot of ligamental laxity. So it was confusing to me. I bring it up because it did come up with this positive result on gene testing. And he had a complication from surgery. I don't think the surgeon did anything wrong because when he probably examined them, I bet they didn't see much. Little, you know, younger person. I can't, I think the kid was nine or so when he first presented and ended up, I saw when he was about 11 or 12. And, um, you know, some ligamental laxity and, hey, you know, I mean, most kids are a little bit flexible, so how hard do you really know? He wasn't excessively flexible, so it's hard to pick up. So I don't know whether the Ellis Danlos led to the Chiari or whether he just had a Chiari, but yet he had a complication maybe from the, Ellis, from the component of Ellis Danlos that may have affected him. Another condition, hydrocephalus. Another one, is it a chicken or an egg issue? What is the problem? Is it the hydrocephalus that's pushing the brain down or is something blocking the flow in the posterior fossa leading to the hydrocephalus? I think that's a question we have to ask. So there's a recent, you know, that, and the reason is that reason why hydrocephalus is also so important is because many of the surgical complications have been reported are probably a result of, high, of some postoperative problem from hydrocephalus. In addition to that, we find that when, and then when this analysis was done, only hydrocephalus was the, was the, was the, was the in a multivariant sort of analysis, we tried to look at mo all factors and then cross-reference those factors. Hydrocephalus was really one of the only ones that had, that showed a significant outcome difference after surgery. So maybe instead of decompressing, they should have operated on the hydrocephalus. Because the ventricles, you know, how we look at it, wasn't that big. They were a little big and started to do it. But yet we find this happens, a lot of people have complications. So, and a lot of this is based on old theories. So Harvey Cushing really pioneered one of the first thoughts about hydrocephalus. This is, for those of you who don't know Harvey Cushing, he was thought to be one of the fathers of, neuro, of modern neurosurgery. Um, you could also tell is old because he looks old, and second thing, that picture looks like it's very old, right? <laughs> so, but what he really thought was that this, this was a third circulation. This was a way of, instead of having Blood circulation, lymphatic circulation, this is the third circulation. It's a circulation of spinal fluid moving from, made by choroid plexus as a byproduct of blood, pushed into the ventricular system, flows from the ventricles to the subarachnoid space, ultimately gets reabsorbed back into the blood stream by having the, flu flow, the, the, the spinal fluid go into the ventricle, out, these outflow openings or foramen in the back part of the brain flow down around the spinal cord, back up to get reabsorbed in these arachnoid granulations. A lot of people even recently, like one of my mentors, DeRocco, he's in Italy, had algorithms when he saw hydrocephalus and Chiari, what to do. You know, thought that, you know, there was a way to figure this out based on Cushing's thoughts. And this is how most of us respond today. The algorithm, I'll, I'll reference it to you, you guys can read it. The reason why I bring it up is because we based it on that theory. But honestly, those theories have been challenged recently. 
In fact, now we're thinking that maybe there's a fourth type of circulation. Right? And this is called a, it's based on another guy, actually from Boston, Bering, uh, in the mid century, mid 20th century, who came up with his concepts of pulsatility. It was also promoted by a dandy who's if you know anything about Cushing and Dandy, they hated each other, so nothing they agreed on. So, of course, if Cushing thought this, Dandy thought this, you know. That's the way neurosurgeons used to be. It used to be very entertaining. We all seem like we all get along, and we all get up here and talk. Back then, we'd just be cursing each other out. It was a lot more entertaining. <laughs> <coughs> it was a lot more fun back then. However, so Dandy thought, so here's the thinking there. Maybe it has nothing to do with flow. Uh, here, here's, how I'll, here's how I'll describe it to you. Maybe it has nothing to do with bulk flow. If you're at the beach, right, how much water really comes in based on the energy of that wave? Very little. What, the wave sort of moves the water up and down. It doesn't really push the water in. At the very end, there's a break. But if you look at most of the time in the ocean, the water's not moving in. It's sort of moving up and down, and it's the wave of pressure that's pushing. If you build a wall there, or a bunch of rocks, over time, just by the sheer pressure wave, those rocks get broken down, and now you have a different channel opened up from all the waves from the beach. So part of pulsatility theory is thought that it's just simply the arterial pulsations, moving waves of water, energy through the spinal fluid, ultimately pushing on the wave of the brain. If you have a, wave, if, if you have a wall and you open that door, the wave comes through smooth, smooth, you know, smoothly, it flows in, it flows out. But you notice you put a wall there, it crashes up against it. So the thinking in the pulsatility theory is that, the way to think about it is that this wave of energy pushes, maybe on the walls of the brain, and ultimately dilated up, causing pressure. And that's the thing that causes the ventricular dilatation. I think there's a component probably of both theories, honestly. I think there probably is some degree of both. And there's, some, there's a lot of studies which I can show you that refute some of the earlier claims on the Cushing model of, of bulk flow of spinal fluid. But I think there's a component of both. How we've been treating this historically is with a shunt, a ventricular perineal shunt. But more recently, we, talked, think, we thought about using a, 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 maybe an internal opening, so sort of like rotorutering, called the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, just making an opening. The reason why that's important is that that's more maybe of like opening the door letting the pressure wave dissipate through a different opening as opposed to bulk flow. Because it's evidence that even when you open the third ventriculostomy, there's some movement back and forth across the opening, maybe like that wave of water that crashes. But there's not a lot of evidence that it really flows all the way around as much as we thought. My gut is that even for Chiari, maybe one of the, might be one of the issues with hydrocephalus there is that by opening up the posterior fossa, we're almost doing, we're dissipating a pressure wave, more so than bulk flow. So it may not have to do with bulk flow spinal fluid, just the wave of pressure, which may be another challenge when we think about flow studies, because that's still based on a bulk flow theory. So I just want to throw it out there. These are things being discussed as modern ways of considering pressure. So again, hydrocephalus, is it a condition secondary to it? Is it a primary condition? Nobody knows, really. Is it an associated condition? We see it. I'm not sure, are they interrelated? Maybe to some degree of, bulk, of pressure waves, but maybe they're not. We don't know that answer. So, so again, another challenging question. You know, um, another challenging thought for you. Here's another associated condition common. Tethered spinal cord, sort of alluded to it earlier. Tethering is when you know, there's something, typically some congenital anomaly of the spinal cord that leads to the, the, the spinal cord, potentially even the brainstem and the cerebellum being pulled down into the frame, leading to the Chiari. <coughs> we often see this, so the imaging often looks like the images over here to, to, to your right, where the spinal cord, instead of ending up here at the L1-2 level, end up down lower. Uh, I should have made that black and white, I'm sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> I learned something, so see, see, we learned something. I should have made it black and white. But what if I make it black and white? So I said, what is that? Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> that's, a, that's a thickened phylum that was at surgery that was cut after stimulation. Um, the issue is that, so here's the issue with tethered spinal cord. Uh, 
Usually, in my experience, even this report, if you really look at tethering, most of the patients were tethering and some degree of tonsil herniation, looking like a type 1 Chiari. Their, their symptom group is a little different than the ones with classic Chiari malformation, at least in my opinion. I'll throw a little opinion out there. They tend to have a different symptom group. This paper sort of supports that. They tend to have more things like maybe some urinary incontinence, maybe some other pains, or leg, lower, more, some more leg weakness or problems or dysfunction as opposed to more arms. All right, even though, but they still could have some headaches, so it gets to be confusing. They tend to, you know, in my experience, if you can sort that out and they have a structure that looks like it, they tend to get a little better. So hopefully that's the way it, So, tether cord, so I'll throw it out there. Another one, cervical stenosis. I'm not, you know, the big thing with cervical stenosis, uh, another associated condition is that, again, I think in, in several different studies sort of looked at cervical stenosis, uh, whether or not, it's, they can be very confusing because they can be, you can have a little Chiari with cervical stenosis at the spot. Um, the symptoms are often similar in both a lot of times. And they're hard to sort out. So should you do, so which one is which? You don't have to, clearly you can have Chiari without cervical spinal stenosis. Clearly you can have cervical spinal stenosis without Chiari. You can have them both together. Are they really interrelated or are they not? It's hard to know. Maybe it's two coexisting conditions because cervical spinal stenosis is common too. You know, as common as Chiari. One we think is more congenital, one we think is more degenerative over time, but you can have congenital spinal stenosis also. So again, how those two correlate and how they work together is challenging. We do know that if you, if for the selected patients, if you operate on them, both can get better. Whether or not you need to do the Chiari plus the cervical stenosis, that's a judgment call. Hopefully there's a finding that may po point you there, but sometimes those findings are difficult to sort out. Pseudotumor, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Anybody knows what idiopathic means, by the way? I hope you guys, you guys know? Oh, good. We know, what is it? Yeah, it means an idiot can't figure out the pathology. That's what it means, right? <laughs> that's what idiopathic really means. Um, that's why I like that term. You know, sounds good. I'd rather just say the idiot can't figure out what's wrong. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning to like it more and more, uh, the more I think about it. I don't like pseudotumor either, because there's nothing pseudo about the symptoms. I don't, I don't, I don't like benign intracranial hypertension either, because most people is not benign. So it can be pretty, pretty malignant for some people. So I guess idiopathic puts it on, on me, so I guess I could take that. <laughs> but re really what it is, is that you have an image, you have increased pressure inside the head, sometimes associated with papilledema and vision loss, with headaches, Sometimes some other associated symptoms with it. But sometimes we also find that there is cerebellar tonsillectopia with it too. And often what we th do think, so often what we do is, so let me go back. So sometimes it looks like this. Here's a set of scans that looks pretty normal when you look at the posterior fossa and other things. That's not uncommon. Sometimes we know, it, we, sometimes we know this idiopathic is not always idiopathic. It could be secondary. Secondary is something like, um, a variant where there's venous obstruction, that's what this is showing you, that can cause secondary engorgement of the brain. So that's that swollen down issue. But often the problem is that we get to the point where there is a Chiari, and here's how we often find Chiari and pseudotumor interrelated. We operate on somebody, and they did lousy after surgery, even worse after surgery than they did before. We don't know why. They don't have hydrocephalus, which we think, oh, that's the only way they can get worse after surgery. Worsening headaches. Now their headaches are here and global all over the place. Even if their structure doesn't change much. And then often, and so often the doctor will say, I don't know what to do. I sent you to the doctor, sent you to somebody else. And I don't know. Maybe it's something else. And those patients sometimes will do intracranial pressure monitoring and find that, um, and find that the ICP is elevated. So now we think they may have this pseudotumor-like syndrome and this Chiari. That's how it was sort of found. 
So a lot of times now, I'll go off and start doing ice IHP biometry before we do the key RX. I hate to see the post-op problems. <laughs> so we'll measure, because the images don't look so bad. They look like a key RI malformation. So we'll do that, and then we'll move on. But that's where the confusion comes in. Which is caused what? Was it really just due to this ICP issue from pseudotumor, or was it due to the structural key RI? A couple other ones real quick. Synostosis is another one. Craniosynostosis, we think that's an abnormal posterior fossa development issue. It's an inherited problem of how the bones, you know, we have these cranial sutures, and those cranial sutures are the links between each bone. And sometimes those bones will, those sutures will fuse together early or prematurely. Uh, most of, a lot of sutures don't fuse until your 20s or 30s. Some fuse early, even the first year of life. That's a normal pattern. But sometimes if, they fuse, if certain ones fuse too early, you can get some re restriction of growth of the bone associated with that suture, without going into more detail. So at times, we'll see something like this. This is a kid who has actually unilateral lambdoid synostosis that in the, if you see the posterior fossa, it looks sort of flattened. The tentorium, this tentorium is, no, the tentorium, which is this, Membrane right here is pretty vertical. And you can see the tonsils are pushed down. So in this situation, some people propose doing a traditional craniectomy, trying to, do a, a, to open the bone up. Um, we've done some other things called cranial distraction. I'll just show you an example, where we'll design a certain cut, put devices in, and sort of crank the devices back to open the back of the skull up. And We've had some good results. I'll show you. We have, all right, well, I've gone, this is going to be published. So I can't show you all the stuff. But we have about 10 kids that we've done this on. And you get some normal alignment of the, of the tentorium, and the tonsils don't look so bad afterwards. We're really primarily treating the synostosis. We decided to do it this way because we had, thought we had better control on how much, on how wide to make things instead of doing a one shot deal. These little devices turn. So we control how much we turned it. We could get a picture say, oh, okay, we thought we did enough, and stop. So that's why we did it that way. But synostosis is another cause. Uh, cranial cerebral anomalies, I uh, know you're going to hear about that. Other conditions often associated with it, autism. And about, unfortunately, probably, you know, autism itself is hard to define. And a lot of patients get scans. Most people who get scans don't find Chiari. But unfortunately, in autism and epilepsy now, we're just like we find 3% 3, 3 of people can have it. Well, there's a little higher percent in those conditions that seem to have Chiari malformation on imaging. Again, I don't know what it means. Maybe we're just selecting out something. Is there some driver that's interrelated? How can you look at something like epilepsy, which can, has so, it's really not an underlying disease. It's a, it's a, it's a symptom of some root cause, right? Autism, we think, is a symptom of some root cause. But is the root cause structural, major structural like this, or some other minor structural or later structural developmental thing in how the brain is patterned and organized? I don't know. But we see it. I get a lot of patients who had things like this or some other minor cyst, and they all have these, these chiaris, and you're like, oh, what do you do with this? How do you, how do you associate these together? Most times, we try not to. Uh, but it could be challenging, because they'll have, then they'll come up, then they'll start having symptoms. You don't know which one is which. They'll have drop attacks. You don't it's, treat the seizures. They still have it. Do a corpus callosotomy. They still have it. You know, other things come up. It gets challenging. Um, there's a whole list of other associated conditions. Hopefully, you can't read them because it gets more and more. Um, they really are hard to ascribe. I, I made it small on purpose, so I didn't want anybody to read it. Uh, so really, I just wanted to say. There's many associated conditions. To me, the take home is that, one, we really want to understand it. If we understood Chiari better, the mechanisms, it'd be easier to understand how the associated conditions relate to the Chiari. Unfortunately, patients are sick, kids are sick, and we're trying to do the best we can to help, help people out with, with really a fundamental lack of understanding or depth of understanding on how to put things together. It's hard enough dealing with Chiari alone in some variant. When you add something else onto it, that just magnifies the complexity tenfold. Um, and that's the challenge. Uh, I, 
So I think part of the goal is as we understand more, we will be able to offer more, more questions, more answers. But really, the root is to how, how do we understand QRE best? And then, obviously, we need to pioneer a lot of these other diseases and see if there's some commonality in the root causes. And that's, a, that, that's the challenge we all face. So I hope uh, I'm, I've inspired you to ask more questions. I hope I didn't answer too many, because I, I don't feel like I answered anything, outside the fact that these are confusing issues. So, oh, now I got questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, so the first question is, could a lumbar puncture in a 30-year-old newborn lead to a QRI malformation? I don't know. Um, I think uh, one lumbar puncture. So here's, a, here's, here's how you have to think about that question. We do so many lumbar punctures in kids, particularly newborns, because they all come with fevers of unknown origin. And part of that is to not miss an under, and so not missed um, and you know, ill-defined meningitis, which really can lead to a lot of complications. So doing an LP makes sense in those situations. Um, is the risk of that causing a Chiari? I guess in the one possibility, you have a persistent leak, it could look something like that. You get some, again, tonsil herniation, I won't call it a Chiari, maybe so. Uh, the real question is, do you stop doing LPs on little kids <laughs> because you're worried about a Chiari forming later on? The answer is no. And since I can't tell you really is causative of it, I would not say we should stop doing LPs on kids because the risk of an undiagnosed meningitis is far, more, is far more damaging to a newborn than a Chiari would be, um, even one that was caused by that. So today's world, that's the best answer I can say. Uh, second, second part is that, uh, okay, would, would, would measuring the poster, I didn't go into poster fossa dimensions uh, I thought that was out of the scope of related conditions. Um, would measuring the posterior fossa be predictive? Um, I'm not sure at this point. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Uh, if you measure it, there are some hints that, that there are some definitions in understanding volumetrics, but how to project that from a newborn, the ratio from a newborn through development, I don't know. That's something I'm sure I think other people are working on it. No. And um, that's a question to ask. What is, the, not just is the posterior fossa small relative to the rest of the anterior and middle fossa, but what's the developmental variation on that over time? That's, that's a very interesting question to ask. We can say that in myeloma, the reason why I was gonna show you the fetal surgery one, we know in myelomeningocele, leakage can cause it, but that's a persistent leakage of herniation. But we also know, you, we also know that the degree of tonsil herniation stops with, with um, if you close it in, in utero, so they don't have as bad of a tonsil herniation. But we also know that the posterior fossa still is abnormal, even in those fetuses. I don't know. The other question is, uh, does uh, the treatment paradigm change in terms of philosophy? No symptoms, no surgery, if the patient has a Chiari and vaginal invagination. I think that was, uh, I wasn't supposed to take that question. But uh, <coughs> I think that, the philosophy that was talked to you about no, no symptoms, no surgery, I think can hold up unless there's something ominous that, do, that is predictive. I guess if there's a lot of instability, even with basal invagination, you might be worried about it with no symptoms. If you demonstrate something, you may push you. But if there's no symptoms, I, fundamentally no surgery still makes sense. Yes. Um, I like the style of uh, you know, giving us the information um, I'm always constantly in my head asking questions. You know, why does my son have Chiari? What was the main cause of it? And um, I have a two-part question. Uh, one of them is, is there a certain Chiari that's co that correlates with um, tethered cord? Um, and also, um, with tethered cord, is leg weakness usually bilateral or unilateral? Uh, great question. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, <coughs> I would love to do the study of taking everybody who writes papers on saying this is a cure into the core and look at the raw data and analyze it out and see what all the variants are. I don't know. I can only tell you sort of my experience. Um, I don't know the answer to that because a lot of times, again, because of terminology, things get called certain things. But we all see there's enough nuances and subtle changes 
even what we call Chiari, that is hard to know. Um, we also know tether quarters is a developmental variant. Unfortunately, I'm a developmental biologist, so I'm going to bore you to death on development. I can say that my basic lesson is that I could find developmental variants on every human being I see. I, I would show you some of mine, but it's really embarrassing. Right? And the problem is that there may be variants even with how the degree of hindbrain herniation is with tethering. Sometimes we don't see it. Uh, and it really is highly variable. So I would say just some degree of tonsil herniation is what we're talking about. Um, sometimes there's been, there's been theories that maybe more brainstem herniation is more related to tethering. But I don't know that. So the answer is that if that was the case, well, all right, you're going to make me do this. So if that was the case, in a myelomeningocele patient whose spinal cord is all the way down at the bottom, however, if you close the back, their tonsils don't look so herniated. But their spinal cord is the, probably the worst form of herniation you can have. So I'm not sure if that's the case. Their brainstem is not so herniated if you fix them in utero, because that, that mechanism therefore is leaking. But they're very tethered low down. So if you look at the results from, from the studies, you'll see that after closure, now their, post -their, their brain still has some abnormalities to it. But if you look at the degree of tonsil herniation, it's not normal, yeah. right? We know they, have a, they still have a vertical tentorium and other things. But, and their brainstem and, and cerebellum don't look so bad. Yet they have the worst tethering that you can find. So I don't know the answer to that. And it doesn't change over time, even with growth. So I don't know the answer to that. What about the PC and unilateral and Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, it could be unilateral or bilateral, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. What we're looking for, really, here's how I look at the weakness in the legs, just to make it clearer. Um, weakness is, is usually not, it, it's often, um, you know, there's dominant muscle groups. So what we're looking at is a generalized weakness, and often one of the dominant muscle groups predominates over it. So just like if you had a hemiparesis from a stroke, people walk like this. And the reason is because your dominant muscle group, your flexor groups, are stronger than your extensors. So you can hold in those positions and you can walk. You have to get, that's why you get contractures in, the, in those positions. I think so a lot of times in kids with tethering, we'll find they start intoing and tripping, especially during more strenuous activities. A lot of that's because dominant muscle group, the whole leg is weak, but often we'll find one leg is tripping more than the other. It could be asymmetric, because we also have things that are dominant in, in us too. So I don't know how to sort that out. I'll say it could be either. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much.